Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, let's see, we're at 11.01, .01, so maybe that's that's a good time to make a start. So um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. John Bischoff to uh, Georgia Tech and Emory as part of our uh, seminar series. Um, so John uh, wears many, many hats, has many titles. He's one of these people who can apparently do it all. He's a great teacher. He's a great administrator, a great researcher. Um, he currently holds the title of Distinguished McKnight University Professor in Mechanical Engineering at the University of Minnesota and also uh, the Endowed Chair for Engineering and Medicine at the same university. Um, he's, he's kind of Berkeley born and raised, and that's literal pretty much. Um, grew up in Berkeley uh, and then uh, got his bachelor's degree and PhD there, uh, kind of in a mixture of uh, mechanical engineering and bioengineering. Um, and then apparently uh, the weather in Berkeley wasn't to his suitable uh, outlook. And so he decided that he wanted to go somewhere colder. Um, so um, I think he did a, a brief postdoc, but then went, went to Minnesota. Um, and uh, so he uh, is highly decorated. He's a fellow of ASME, IMB, AIMBE, uh, the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science, which I didn't know. He's a von Humboldt Fellow, uh, won an NSF Career Award. He directs an NSF ERC um, uh, in Minnesota for his sins, um, and also is the director of the Institute for Engineering and Medicine, so kind of like our equivalent of the IPB. So he's the Andres Garcia of, of Minnesota. Um, he's uh, very highly cited, very highly published. Um, Kind of his, his, you know, the weather in Minnesota wasn't cold enough, so he had to get even colder. And uh, so he's really well known for a lot of things, but I think he's going to talk to us today about uh, some of his work in cryogenics. Um, and I was kind of amazed by the diversity of um, journals in which he published. So Nature Biotech, Science Translational Medicine, Blood, Cryobiology, IEEE Transactions, Urology, so this is uh, somebody who's working in lots of different areas. So John, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Welcome uh, to Atlanta, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Ross. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, that was very generous, Ross. Thank you. Uh, it's always been a pleasure to interact with uh, Ross over the years in our, our time in the uh, ASME Bioengineering Division and of course in, in biomechanics as, as well. And it's really a pleasure to be back here in Georgia Tech. I knew Bob Nara personally, and uh, he actually tried to recruit me down to Georgia Tech at one point, and uh, that was to actually join his ERC, uh, which was one of the first, I think, in the tissue engineering space. And it, so it's really an honor and a, and a pleasure to be here. Talk a little bit about our ERC, which I think maybe is getting close to solving that problem that Bob posed to me those many years ago around uh, actually cryogenically suspending and rewarming living biological systems like tissue engineered products and, and regenerative medicine products. So uh, I'm not sure this is, whoops, working, is this? Yes, all right, so I wanna start off by thanking all the people that did all the work. On the left-hand side is my lab, uh, and this is a little bit of false advertising because the weather in Minnesota isn't actually like that, you know? <laughs> And we had some significant others in that, uh, you know, plot, uh, that, that photo. Uh, we also had the smaller group from the lab there. On the right-hand side is actually the ERC. So this is our faculty and staff on the top and our trainees on the bottom. So we're six institutions, 30 plus faculty, 100 plus trainees. And we, we think of technicians as well as the undergraduates and the graduates that are part of this as part of that uh, the, the, the council, if you will, of the trainees. So it's really a, a delight to work with all these people. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is really coming from these people. So to get an ERC, and, and I'm going to kind of blend the ERC along with talking a little bit about some of the work that I do in my lab. Uh, you know, you have to talk about societal impact. If uh, you aren't solving some greater problem for society, you won't have a chance to get one of these. Uh, these are now Gen 4. It's $26 million, uh, you know, five-year renewable, so 52 uh, total over 10 years, and then they want you to leverage that. So I was just chatting with Ross and Jonah and others about, like, 
they're also in this, are we going to be able to sustain our ERC when it's done? And we're definitely in those conversations now with many of our stakeholders. And I think the way to do that is that you figure out what are you addressing? And so we sort of have these three buckets, you know, healthcare is the one that certainly impacts the most in biomedical engineering, but increasingly biodiversity as well as sustainability in food are really, really important. And they kind of overlap with, I would say, human healthcare. And so you can see some of the, the specific uh, applications there that we're working on, you know, in terms of transplantable organs, working on organoids uh, and cell therapies in the, in the health space, but also biobanking, coral cryopreservation, as well as vertebrate model systems in biodiversity and then food supply. We're very interested in aquaculture. So we've been able to actually cryopreserve embryos of fish for the very first time. And we're trying to figure out how that can be deployed to feed the world sustainably. Uh, and then invasive species management and even food products, how to use freezing in that space. So these are kind of like, this is the big landscape or the universe of what we deal with in the ERC. So one of the reasons that people get these again is that you talk about why this is big enough, not only to, that you have these societal benefits, but also that there's a team that can go after this that's truly really convergent. And so convergent team science is something that the National Academies has written about quite a bit. And my deputy director is Mehmet Toner at, uh, uh, he's partially uh, MIT and Harvard. If you talk to Mehmet, he'll say that actually convergent team science was first written about by somebody at MIT, not the National Academies. I'm not sure if that's true. But anyways, the idea is that you are really going beyond your field. So, you know, you sort of see the, uh, let's call it the hard, harder sciences, you know, thermodynamics, heat transfer, physical science uh, on the right. And we're blending that with the medical and biological sciences on the left. And we come together to address these overarching problems that exist in cryopreservation and how we want to go about suspending these living biological systems uh, in a uh, frozen or low temperature space. So the, the three overarching challenges are excessive ice formation, the cryoprotectant toxicity. So these are the antifreeze, biologically compatible antifreeze molecules that you add. If you add too much of them or at too high a temperature, it can be toxic. And then also like if you have a bulk system, like an organ that you're able to actually preserve and you try to surface rewarm that, convectively rewarm that, you're actually gonna come up fast on the side and leave the center behind. This is like dropping an ice cube in a drink. It cracks every time. So we have to address these three overarching uh, challenges. And so we're doing it through the ERC. Um, and I'm not gonna um, spend too much more time going through this, but one of the uh, things about an ERC is that it has four pillars. So you have engineering workforce development, uh, a culture of inclusion, uh, an innovation ecosystem, where you're actually trying to translate these things out for societal benefit, commercialize them, and of course, convergent research. One of the things that we added in our ERC that I don't believe was in any other ERC before this is ethics. And so that's been really powerful because we're trying to get ahead of these conversations about these new technologies and how they might be adopted by society and actually you know, helping to engage the public and get ahead of it. So we don't have like genetically modified crops, you know, that type of a conversation that kind of got stopped, but rather we get ahead of it and people can understand what the risks and benefits are and hopefully adopt. Whoops. So how did this evolve? I, I've been in cryobiology. The, the field really started with the society in the 1960s and it's been sort of puttering along. And Mehmet and I have been in it since we were graduate students. Um, it's been sort of a sleepy little society of a couple hundred people. It's an international society. But what really happened is within about 15 years or so, things kind of exploded. And it, it's just uh, a number of different technologies came to bear on some of these problems. And so above the timeline, you're seeing some really fantastic work that was coming out of Berkeley, MGH, some of it from Minnesota and some other places, allowing us to do things that had never been done before, bringing back some of these biological systems, suspending them in a super cooled state or a partially frozen state or a vitrified state and then bringing them back. And the bookends are 
two really exciting articles from the MGH group. One is showing that you can take rat livers out to four days and you can then transplant them when they're functioning normally. And the other is this nature biotechnology cover where they did it not in a rat liver, but they did it in a human liver showing that the outcome of that was something that could be transplanted into a human. That's exciting because livers only, they're a highly metabolic organ and they really don't preserve well for more than a few hours. So being able to go out days is just phenomenal. And this could not have shown up at a better time. It, it was literally in September of 2019. And that was right when we had our site visit, our original site visit. So we were really, really excited about that. And there's other things in here. Uh, isochoric uh, is isovolumetric. It doesn't allow the ice to grow because you basically cap the vessel and you can't have a, uh, an expansion. Uh, and then there's some other things that I'm gonna tell you about uh, nano warming. But the other thing that we did is all of this community building down here that you see with the Society of Crowd Biology, but also summits around organ banking, as well as this consensus article, which I recommend to anybody interested in the field. This is a, in 2017, Nature Biotechnology, very highly cited and very forward thinking and really helped roadmap out what we wanted to do in the ERC. So this is uh, daunting. This is, I don't really like looking at these, but this is what you do in an ERC is you actually play this game and you, you try to uh, work with what's called a, a, a three plane diagram and you can see all the different components of it. The, uh, you know, Chris Roy was, he shared his with me when I was thinking of putting this together and, and several other ERC directors were generous in, in sharing. And I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but basically by putting in all of this, uh, you know, time to actually, and it takes months to figure out what goes where and how this all fits together, you are in fact beginning to create this convergent team approach, which is really, really powerful. And so I'll just point out a couple of things here. Uh, you know, the education, workforce development, culture of inclusion, the stakeholders, uh, the innovation ecosystem for the commercialization, and then the convergent research pieces over here on the, on the left. And I'll just focus on a couple of uh, quick things here. So the thrust areas we have are really around biological engineering which is how do you prepare the biological system to go into a state of suspended animation? And this usually means how do I, you know, use something like an apoptotic inhibitor or a cryopreservative agent and get it into and out of this uh, biological system without damaging it. TA2 or the thrust two is really manipulating water in the system so that you can actually go to that state of suspended animation. And the lower you go in temperature, the lower your metabolism and the longer you can store. And we'll get into that here a little bit more in a moment. And then the third thrust is once you've reached that state of suspended animation, how do you come back? And you need to come back rapidly and uniformly enough so that it remains viable and functional for whatever your, your reasoning of use. And then our test beds in a lot of ERCs, these test beds are not biological systems. For us, we chose to focus on living biological systems as the test beds. So cells for cell therapies, microphysiological systems and tissues to basically reduce the cost around drug testing or maybe even for transplantable uh, islets or the use of hepatocytes for bioartificial livers, whole organs. So you're getting the right organ to the right person at the right time. And if you have time, you can actually do immune tolerance induction protocols, which means that that organ is gonna stick around longer after you've done the transplant. And then whole organisms, which could be a whole variety of different organisms. And we'll talk about both insects and fish and other model systems and why that's important, not just for biomedical engineering, but potentially for biodiversity as well. So here they is just another way of looking at this and, and just uh, hitting a couple of other high uh, high level points, but like, you know, clinically relevant cells, this is something Jonah and I were just talking about. We wanna probably do a center to center grant together to help because storage and transport of cell therapy products is like a really big deal today. NK cells, T cells, you can go and find these nature articles that say cryopreservation doesn't work. Well, you need cryopreservation or something like it, or you're not gonna be able to do cold supply chain 
on these products. And so this is a huge area, immune cells, T cells, iPSC cells. So this is a really uh, hot topic area. Microphysiological systems, uh, I was just talking with Shu last night about this and he's super interested in this. Uh, it's an up and coming field. Alongside of that, you have liver slices, kidney slices and other things, if you had them off the shelf that you could use to actually reduce the cost around drug discovery, which is something like $2 billion per successful drug if you, if you factor in all the failures. So if we could reduce that, that would be great. Uh, and then, you know, lots of organs and lots and lots of different examples of whole organisms. So uh, since we got the ERC, we've continued to publish in each of these areas, and we're beginning to focus now in cells, tissues, organ organoids, organs, and whole organisms. Lots of high-level publications. I'll, I'll highlight a few of them. And we've continued to build uh, the community through the Society of Crabiology, uh, the Association of Organ Procurement Organizations, uh, as well as Termis coming up, and, and we're building and growing and, and going to other uh, conferences as well. So this is really a summary slide of the technologies, and it, it's really a kind of a simple concept. The lower the temperature, the longer the duration. And the longer the duration, the more you can do this cold supply chain that everybody really needs around each one of these products. So <clears throat> today, what people literally do uh, at organ procurement organizations, and these are spread throughout the United States, they take the organs from the donor, literally put it in a box with ice, and ship it wherever it's gonna go. Usually it's on, uh, uh, sometimes it's on a commercial flight and you'll actually see it in a little red box, but a lot of times they'll hire like a little charter plane that'll fly this around or that'll drive, you know, if you, if you can get it, uh, you know, in a city, you can drive it obviously. But this is it, this is like, you know, state of the art organ work. And I'm using organs here as just an example, but you can imagine the same thing being true for the other uh, test beds. So the MGH group came along and I showed you their articles. You know, they're able to actually super cool rat and human organs out now. And my understanding uh, between super cooling and now partial freezing, they can get out to 30 days, 30 days for a kidney and a whole week for a human liver. I mean, this is phenomenal. This is going to change or could change and disrupt organ transplant right, if it's adopted. And that's where the ethics people come in. It's like, how do we, and the regulatory people come in. Um, this partial freezing, super cooling, I think is pretty clear. You're below the, the melt and you're maybe just a couple degrees below, but you're metastable and you don't wanna actually trigger that system to actually freeze. Another way of doing this is we learn from nature. So this is Rana Silvatica. So like Ross, this frog is from Canada. And uh, it actually can survive with 65% of its water in the frozen state, but very, very controlled. So what it does is it, it actually just forms ice in the vasculature, doesn't form it in the cells. And the liver, it, it's a slow process. It's under the leaf litter, under the ice, under the snow. It's a slow process whereby it begins to freeze in its digits. And it pumps out huge amounts of glucose, which is basically the cryoprotective agent for all of those organs. And uh, the cells never freeze. So this frog is sitting there, brain dead, cardiac arrest for like a month or two or three at a time during the winter. If it thaws, it'll hop off. If it has to freeze again, it'll refreeze. And it can do this two or three times during the course of the winter and survive. So they have a non-metabolizable glucose that they're using at MGH to actually recapitulate what that frog is doing in a human liver. And it's just, it's really, really exciting what they've been able to achieve. What we're interested in is actually going one step further. So while this can get you out to weeks and months, we wanna maybe go indefinite. And so there are two ways of getting there. One is that you're frozen on the left and the other is that you are actually in a vitrified state or a glassy state on the right. This is an iconic image that actually was there when I was doing my PhD at Berkeley. 
uh, from a guy named Greg Fahey, who has probably studied vitrification of organs and vitrification in general more than anybody else in the world. And I would rather be this one. Uh, and he has argued and shown that these organs are viable that are in this vitrified state. And we're gonna get into why that hasn't transformed uh, you know, organs here in, in a moment, but this is where we're trying to go because once you're in that vitrified state and you're at a low enough temperature below the glass transition temperature, you truly are stable for an indefinite period of time. And the part that's really exciting from the point of view of the ERC and engineers is that this is kind of like a thermodynamic problem. We're playing around with thermodynamic variables, right? Temperature, pressure, and concentration of these CPAs we have to get them in and out, which is usually transport processes. And that's what allows us to, to get to this suspended animation. So this is like a grand you know, problem for the field and it's been really exciting to, to work on it. So how do, we, how do we get back? Basically, we've been able to get to this vitrified state and now I'm sort of transitioning into things that come from my lab or from the University of Minnesota and my collaborators more so. If you, uh, so like I say, if you Google vitrified organs, you're probably gonna get this image. This is like the most highly cited paper in the Journal of Cryobiology. And uh, it's from Greg. And you know he got there by adding an antifreeze, just like we do to our cars, uh, but it's more biologically compatible and it's a cocktail and he had to really work this out. He's still working it out. Uh, polymers, as well as organic solvents, as well as sugars. Uh, and eventually you get to this glassy state. Now, the, the reason why this isn't being used now clinically is that he could never rewarm these successfully. So if you rewarm using boundary warming approaches, you basically run into a couple of problems. One is that you're gonna crystallize on the way back up because even though it looks like a glass, it's seeded with tiny nuclei already. And the second is that Using a boundary approach, it's gonna be like that ice cube that you drop in your drink and it's gonna crack. So how do we get around this? So here are all these systems because this actually generalizes out, right? It isn't just the organ, it's all these test beds at all these scales, they all have the same problem. And the, the problem is that if you look at the critical warming rates versus the critical cooling rates, you see something really interesting. And that is that we can probably get to the vitrified state just like Greg did because you're traveling at single degrees per minute, which is something that's achievable in the lab today. But coming back from that, you're traveling at somewhere between 10 to 100 C per minute. In a bulk system, that's not easy because you're gonna be doing it from the boundary. And what you get is either you're going too slow and you're gonna devitrify, so you're gonna go from a glass to a crystalline state or you're gonna come up too fast because of this boundary effect and you're gonna crack. So uh, this is uh, the question. And so how fast do we need to go? And as you go to smaller systems and you have smaller amounts of cryoprotective agent, you need to travel faster, right? So the organ, these uh, X's here, this is all Greg's work, Greg Fahey's work. And you can see here, I'm traveling substantially less than one degree a minute. And I can do that. It's just that I'm gonna to have to come back at 50 C per minute. And that's harder to do in the, in the lab. And if you drop, you start dropping down in concentration and the rates go up uh, uh, as well. So how do we go faster? Well, one way going to these smaller systems like droplets, you don't see a lot going on in the droplet space because you're in this lower concentration regime. Uh, Peter Mazur introduced the concept of working with a pulsed laser. This is an NDEA 1064 nanometer laser, not absorbed tremendously by water. He added broadband absorbers like India ink, colloidal carbon basically. And that worked. And he was showing that he could actually rescue, these are mouse oocytes here. He was rescuing mouse oocytes that had even been partially crystallized on the way down. So this was a really interesting result and he generalized this for a lot of different systems and we started following this as well. And we started thinking about, well, how can we use this more generally? And so we're using this now for a thing called laser nano warming. India Inc., if you inject that into a biological system is rather toxic 
even though you can use it for staining purposes, et cetera. But if you're using a photonic gold nanoparticle that is linked, the absorption cross-section is basically linked by plasmon resonance to the wavelength of the laser, you can actually put that inside your system and you can rewarm at tremendously high rates. So like you can travel at tens of millions of degrees C per minute. And so what we can do then is we can begin to understand in a really defined way in this lower concentration regime, smaller droplet, smaller uh, test bed regime, what it takes to both get to the vitrified state and to come back. And so up here you see failure, crystalline, 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 but as you go faster and faster or you add more CPA, eventually you succeed. And these are showing you what happens on the way back up. You can overheat, you're blowing the bubble completely off. So that's a, both of these are vitrified droplets or you have an ideal warming case on, on the bottom. And so what was really uh, exciting here and Joe uh, Congas did this work uh, in my lab you can do this with a high-speed camera, and this is happening over a millisecond, literally, right, or two. And you can trace from when it's in liquid nitrogen to where it's melted to where it's boiled, and you can begin to get rates off of this, experimental rates. Now, there's, there's some, you know, this is not perfection, but this is better than anything before because people had no idea what the rates were. And so what that allows you to do then is you can begin to understand what the critical rates needed are for specific concentrations of these cryoprotective agents. You can see what the impact is when you begin to create cocktails between organic solvents and sugars. And we can begin to get a little bit more engineering about this and, and proactively design these, these droplet systems. So that's what we did. And we basically applied this to one of our first cases. And this is the first fish embryo that was ever brought back. So I showed you, Peter was able to do mouse oocytes. They're about 100 microns. Anybody who's worked with oocytes, all mammalian oocytes are about that size. These are 800 microns in diameter. So, you know, orders of magnitude about 1,000 times bigger in volume. And Peter tried his idea with broadband absorption of India ink around the embryo, and it didn't work for the same reasons that we talked about. You've got differential heating, right? So we put the photonic, uh, you know, the plasmonic nanoparticles inside. We cooled and vitrified using what's called a cryotop. And then when we wanted to bring it back, we used this laser nano warming. And in fact, we were able to show that we could bring some of these embryos back. So there's still work to be done here, but this is the first time anybody uh, has been able to do that. And so this is not perfect. We have sort of low percentages that are coming back, but some of them are actually growing. And the ones that do grow are fecund. So they're able to actually breed uh, in the same manner as a control fish, which is really exciting. Here's a couple of them that made it. And this is the work of Dr. Konev Kosla. So where did we go next? All right, so we had some success with one test bed and one model system. We decided to begin to work with some other ones. And this is where Dr. Li Zan came along. Uh, and he had already been doing some great work in the lab. Uh, we're mostly, we're like a, I'm in a mechanical engineering department, so people, I'm a heat transfer thermodynamics guy. So mostly we somehow figure out how to do things that have to do with heating and cooling, in case you didn't see the light motif here. Uh, so yeah, Lee was working on some other work with plasmonics, but also heat transfer based work. And he looked back in the literature and Peter Mazur, who's considered one of the grandfathers of the field, had published in Nature on Drosophila cryopreservation in the 1990s. Again, right around the time when I was finishing up my PhD. Nobody has been able to repeat that protocol. And so Lee took it upon himself. He's like, well, I'm gonna engineer the poop out of this. And so he jumped on that. And you know, he also looked at the, the use case, right? Drosophila lines in the world today, 160,000 and growing. And you know how they deal with them? They flip them, literally. So they just keep them growing. And so one of the problems with that, they do this with zebrafish as well and a lot of other model systems because they don't have crowd preservation, <clears throat> is that you get genetic drift, you get mutation, and you get a lot of other issues. And you start growing in size because you're keeping more and more lines alive. So his concept was, you know, hey, let's put some of those lines away. 
let's take the lines that you like and put them away too so that there's, you can come back to them. You, can, you don't have to lose that genetic information. Uh, and you know, he, uh, he applied himself to this and he came up with this really robust protocol. And I won't go through all the different pieces of it, but you have to, it's a waxy layer around these, uh, these embryos. You have to get rid of that with uh, solvents. And then you load with cryoprotective agent uh, and you have to do that uh, at the right temperatures in order to avoid toxicity. You then um, wick away the cryoprotective agents and that gets rid of a lot of thermal mass so you can actually travel at faster rates. And then you go into your liquid nitrogen storage, which is indefinite essentially. When you wanna bring them out, you use usually sugars. So sucrose, uh, high and then lower concentrations of sucrose to help that CPA get out of the embryo. And then you can actually uh, grow them out. And so that's what he did. And he was able to show, uh, this is just showing how he did some of the analysis around the rates that he needed. And he was matching the rates very carefully with the amount of cryoprotective agent to again, make sure that he was getting vitrified and that he wasn't devitrifying on the way back up. And he did it for 25 different lines, which was phenomenal. No one's done that before. And he also showed that if you have a line like this uh, S1 here, that's not particularly uh, good at cryopreservation, you can take like a GFP line here, which does pretty well. And you can cross them in and you can get a, you can get much better results. And then you can cross them back out later if you want to. So there's a lot of different tricks you can play to actually keep that genetic information. And the other part that, that I love is, and, and he loved, you know, uh, is that the hatch rates stay consistent and the adult rates stay consistent. And this was out a full year. So, and we expect that that's gonna continue out many, many years. So this was a great result. And we took that mesh that he was working on there, that was a, actually a nylon mesh. And then we said, okay, well, this is Zheng Chi Guo, who actually is in uh, a postdoc that followed up from Lee, and he decided to jump in on that mesh and just uh, engineer the mesh. So there's so many different pieces of this, but he basically took it from a nylon relatively insulating mesh to one that is uh, more conductive. And you can play around with the pore size as well as the wire diameter. You know, you can think about the, the, the metal that you use, whether it's copper or stainless steel or whatever. Uh, copper ends up being actually toxic to some of the materials that we work with. So you have to, you have to coat that with something like gold, et cetera. So there's a lot of engineering in there. And then you have to avoid Leiden frost. So Leiden frost is a big problem with these things. The vapor, uh, the vapor layer that you form during the boiling process and liquid nitrogen is relatively insulating. So he came up with a plunging process that basically sheds the vapor layer very, very quickly. And you can actually equilibrate very, very fast. So this, alone changes your rates by an order of magnitude. And, uh, and then you, you get you know, more vitrified systems that look like this on, on the mesh. And the principles are relatively simple. You know, you're increasing the rate of uh, heat transfer off of the mesh by playing around with the thermal resistance of the mesh, which is the, the thermal conductivity primarily, but there's other things around how much uh, is going through the mesh itself, the pores that you also have to pay attention to. So he's used this in a variety of different systems now. Uh, and this is coral. And I think I mentioned coral is one of our areas of great interest in uh, the ERC. This is a collaboration with the Smithsonian. You can see this is the mushroom coral and you can see some of the, the steps here which are very similar to the steps I described already for Drosophila. So I'm not gonna go through that again. And then here you see these are actual coral larvae that are vitrified on the mesh. And the reason why this is exciting versus say the zebrafish case that I showed you before is like you can do hundreds and thousands of coral in one time versus doing one zebrafish at a time, which is what I showed you so far. And it's really uh, this piece here. So you're uh, changing, it, it's more than just what you see here, but there's a lot of engineering around exactly how to get the mesh um, optimized for this. But you can jump from you know 20% uh, survival to almost 90% survival just through designing the mesh. And of course the rates go up with that as well. And so this allows for a number of different firsts. 
uh, we, we did this with uh, Dr. Mary Hagedorn and Jonathan Daly. Mary works in Hawaii. She's part of the Smithsonian. Jonathan Daly is down working on the Great Barrier Reef where everybody knows there's a, a big crisis down there around the coral. And you can see this, this work, we didn't do, of course, all of this. This coral sperm is something that's used. Sperm cryopreservation is like where the whole field started. Back in 1949, there's a very famous Nature article. So this was kind of a known technology which they can use, but it doesn't get the other half of the genome, right? And so uh, there's been a lot of emphasis to try to get to the embryo. And so that's where uh, uh, we worked here on coral larvae with Mary. We've even been able to work on uh, whole adult fragments. And the reason why this is so exciting right now is that you don't have to wait for the two or three evenings, literally per year when the moon is right, that the coral is gonna breed. The coral fragment means you can go to the coral and you can take off the polyps and you can do this at any time. So this is transformative if we can actually work with the coral fragments. Uh, and so then you can see where that's going, right? So scaling, biobanking, assisted gene flow, a lot of really exciting opportunities. And this becomes a bit of a model system for how we might work with other uh, ecosystems and other keystone species. So uh, this is kind of where Drosophila is going, uh, again, using the cryo mesh to improve it. We were using a lower concentration, so we had a little bit lower um, survival rate with that, but we can come right back up using a, a modified uh, mesh. And then this is kind of showing where this can go. This is a model system. So we're actually NIH funded uh, for, this is an R24 uh, grant. And uh, we're creating a Canvas site where we can actually teach labs all throughout the world. And also we're collaborating with the Bloomington Stock Center that has half of the lines in the world for Drosophila to actually uh, you know, take these uh, crop preservation approaches out there and actually address this cold supply chain again of, uh, of cryopreserved embryos. And zebrafish, this also has an impact in zebrafish. So what I showed you before is that we can actually do a single zebrafish at a time with a little thing called a cryotop, which is fine if you're dealing with assisted reproductive technologies for human beings, which is how it was first come, came into being for embryos. But we wanted to actually do, we need to do many, many more than that if we're gonna actually have an impact in aquaculture or uh, even you know, keeping uh, whole lines alive. So what this is showing, again, is the work of Zhong Qi, getting much higher survival, or, I'm sorry, much higher vitrification rates, uh, which goes along with cooling rates. And you can kind of see that down here, nylon versus uh, uh, metal, you're getting quite a bit more vitrified zebrafish. So now if we could harvest those and then uh, automate a system and put them under the laser, because right now the mesh doesn't go quite fast enough for us to rewarm these. Like I said, you have to go much, much faster when you're rewarming. Then we can actually begin to think about this also being used with zebrafish, and that's coming. So we have automation in microinjection, and that actually takes us, uh, that can help us get to a higher vitrification rate as well as a, um, you know, we are moving from like only 3%-ish going to adult that I showed you before. Now we're up to almost 10%. And this is with Suhasa Kandanamaraya at, uh, uh, and he's a robotics expert at Minnesota. All right, so the impact here then is maybe this can be used in all these different model systems, right? And this is of interest because this is gonna lead into human health. All these model systems use uh, we, we, we use them to understand diseases in the human systems, but it also could be used on endangered species. So this is a paper from Paul Ehrlich's group in Stanford, uh, you know, circling the drain, right? And this is the red list. If you haven't looked up what the red list is, I encourage you to do so. Endangered species, critically endangered species, species going extinct all over the world. Maybe there's a way to work with groups like this, Nature's Safe, where they're taking the gametes from these endangered species and actually banking them for the future. Maybe even putting them on the moon in a biorepository so we don't lose this critical endangered species. All right, um, so I'm gonna shift and now really uh, end with one other uh, story. And, and well, two quick stories in the human health regime because a lot of this had to do with uh, model systems. 
So we're gonna shift back to healthcare. And I'll start with talking about pancreatic islets and organoids. <clears throat> so very similar approach. This is actually Lizanne's work again with a fellow named Joe Rao. And uh, we are taking multiple different types of pancreatic islets and trying to cryopreserve them. So it's a balance between the CPA toxicity and the ice formation, as I've been saying for all of the other examples that I gave you. And we have to make sure that we have the right cooling and warming rates. We have lots of readouts that we're using to uh, determine success. We're using a mesh again. We're using some of the same ideas, wicking away the preservative, making sure we have those high rates of cooling, but also even faster rates of rewarming. And then this is critical. And this is actually true for all the systems that we've been talking about. We're actually making sure for kind of like the first time from an engineering point of view, that we have the right concentration and the right rate actually truly get to the vitrified state. Here's the literature that failed in cryopreservation of islets, and they're clearly in the, in the, in the crystallization zone, which is, is failure. Well, uh, you can see, maybe there's a little bit, to, it may be hard to see this, but the, the control and the vitrification and rewarming look dramatically better than conventional freezing, slow freezing with ice. And you can see again, live control, vitrification, rewarming versus conventional using confocal. The red is bad here, okay. Uh, and then um, some membrane dye assays here, again, also showing that we're doing this mouse, uh, you know, stem cell derived, porcine and human, all of them showing vitrification and rewarming close to control in terms of viability. And um, we are able to do this out to nine months of storage. And the real proof in the pudding was that when we put it back into diabetic mice, we were curing the, the, the mice. And we're doing it with 250 islets. We use conventional 450 islets, so double almost. And it's not addressing the glucose, right? It's not uh, curing the animals. And here we are down here, control and vitrification are rewarmed, perfect. All right, so last story, we're using uh, I was telling somebody earlier that, you know, like we got interested in nanoparticles for a completely different reason earlier in my career, <laughs> actually cancer, treating cancer. A lot of people were working on that. And we started thinking about, well, what could that do to be the volumetric warming in bulk systems? And so what this is showing you are the, are the steps that I'm going to go, I'm going to talk you through all of these steps here in a moment, but we're basically using this to address Greg Fahey's kidney. So that kidney that we can vitrify, but we can't rewarm, we figured out how to do that. And we published that recently in uh, Nature Communication. And then it got picked up because there was a writer who was starting a story about the ERC and he got interested. And we took the cover of Science uh, last June. And it's actually a really fascinating story. It's more than just us and, and the people in the lab. It talks about the ERC as well. So if you're interested, uh, I think it's a it's a pretty good read. Of course, I'm biased, but uh, anyways, this is what it looks like. Um, more really nice uh, pictures, but this is the the stages, right? So you need to get the cryoprotectant and the iron oxide, which is part of that, into the kidney. You need to then actually vitrify that system correctly, and then mag magnetic rewarming is what you're using. So you're creating. It's an inductive field. So this, this field has been around for a long time. Inductive welding, if you, if you know how two metal pieces come together sometimes with a non-contact approach, it's inductive, uh, inductive welding. We're using essentially the same kind of coils and we're, we're basically rewarming over the course of like two minutes. We're bringing something from liquid nitrogen up to uh, room temperature. And then we flush out those uh, nanoparticles, actually we would be below room temperature because we don't want toxicity, but we're up to the melt temperature. We reattach to a, a perfusion device, flush it out, and then we, we put it into the animal. So this is Joe and, and Zong Hu, they're co-first authors on this. Zong Hu was doing the engineering piece. Joe is, uh, so he's a postdoc in um, mechanical engineering, heat transfer guy. And Joe is a postdoc in my colleague's lab, who's uh, an, a surgeon, a transplant surgeon, and Joe is a postdoc in, in surgery. So it was a great team effort. But I wanna highlight a couple of things that had to also happen. 
And this is, gets at the team science piece. None of these things I could have done at the beginning of my career, nor even today, without the help of other fields. So this is chemistry. You need to have that magnetic nanoparticle that can actually be suspended in a high concentration, eight to nine molar organic solvent, all right? I don't know any chemist that's looked at that, ever. And what happens is if you just take commercially available ferrofluids and you put it into a cryoprotective agent, they, they just, I mean, these high concentration CPAs, they just crashes. Imagine putting that into an organ. Well, that's what it looks like. It's gonna get stuck in the glomeruli, it's gonna get stuck in the vasculature. So what Z did, uh, along with uh, Christy Haynes' lab, who's a chemist at Minnesota, uh, is we coated it. So we coated it first with silica, then with polyethylene glycol, and uh, it stays in suspension very nicely over six months and beyond. Now, when you put it into the organ, it's distributing and you kind of like see the vasculature of the organ, which is what you would expect to see if you've got a, a high contrast. Uh, this is a micro CT, so it's a high contrast uh, uh, you know, particle in the vasculature. And this is the washout data. So, you know, here's fresh. So you're very low here. Uh, here's EMG, fully loaded, unloaded. You don't really get it all out, right? And here's the SIONP. You get it in and you get it out. And this dotted line here is FDA approved concentrations of iron that are allowed in the blood. So it, it's, it's working. Uh, the other piece is now you got to get it into the organ. So Zhang Hu is a transport guy, not just heat, but also perfusion. So he took the cover of the annals here uh, back in 2023 as well, focused on how to get the high concentration of CPA into the organ. So right now, using an established protocol for putting CPA in, this is from Greg's lab, he was only able to get to about seven molar. And this is even with dropping the temperature to minus 22, but basically, you know, keeping the pressure constant and, uh, I'm sorry, keeping the, uh, right, the pressure constant and the concentration ramping up along the way. So this actually didn't work. So we were, this, this failed under micro CT, you could say, see that it had failed. So he actually designed using a crow cylinder model, a two compartment model, uh, a better approach. He basically changed the, uh, using the model, he changed the pressure, he went a little higher and he went a little longer duration to get in more. And he also kept the temperature higher, which helped with the diffusivity of the CPA into the tissue. And so this one actually worked. You're almost a molar higher in concentration, but the same CPA. And so that was dramatic. And that allowed us then to get to a vitrifiable protocol I won't go through all the details of this, but we had the cooling rate as well as the warming rate using nano warming that made it successful. And we use micro CT as a, as a proof of principle or quality control for that. So we know we're actually vitrified here uh, and then we can come back from that. And this is what happened after transplant. So we're basically putting a, a kidney that's been cryopreserved like this up to a hundred days in liquid nitrogen and we put it back into a recipient where this is the only kidney, the only kidney that's preserving the life of that rodent. You can see there's a spike in creatinine, there's a spike in some of the other biomarkers, but they come down after about two weeks. If this had been a patient, there would have been all sorts of interventions to bring the creatinine down and to uh, deal with this. But this was like worst case scenario, we just put it in. Uh, and you can see it balancing out after about two weeks, everything seems to be converging back and we had to sack the animal. But none of these animals died on their, on their own. We had to sack them at the 30 day endpoint. And then we can see gross and, and histology, the, both the fresh uh, and the nano warmed are, are looking uh, very similar uh, versus the 60 hour cold stored, which really uh, was beginning to come apart. So again, really nice job from uh, Zhang Hu and Joe. So where are we going now? And this is just my last couple of slides. Well, that was a rodent organ. Now we need to go to larger organs. So we're working on pig and human. This is one liter systems here. And we're going up to 2.5 liter systems. So one liter, that could be a, a human kidney easily. 
could be a human heart. 2.5 liters could be a liver lobe, possibly a folded smaller liver. So we're actually trying to actually do this now on, on that scale of, of system. We're looking at lots of different types of cryoprotective agents. Here's cracked and crystallized failure modes that we want to understand. And then, of course, you know, liquid and then vitrified, uh, which are the success modes. And this is Laksha helping uh, Zong Hu do this. And this is a system that's a unique, as far as I know, inductive system that we uh, actually had in COVID, you can see with our little masks on, installed. This was right at the very beginning of the ERC. That's a 2.5 liter coil that can take those 2.5 liter bags. And we are actively rewarming that size system now, although we, uh, we haven't published anything on, on pig or human yet. So rewarming matters. Lots of excellent work from the, the trainees in the, in the group. And just to orient you here, because this is what we kind of talked about, different size scales, right? Different amounts of concentration of this cryoprotective agent that's loaded into those systems. And then if you have less of the cryoprotective agent, you need to travel at really high uh, rates, so very high cooling rates and high warming rates. So you need to use things like laser and nanowarming, which is kind of at the edge of what we can do tens of millions C per minute, versus down here on the other end, RF nanowarming of whole bulk systems up to liters, where we might be traveling at something like one to 10 C per minute on the way down, but maybe you know 50 to 100 or a little bit above C per minute on the way back up, and lots of different uh, introductory technologies that I showed you in between. So with that, um, if you found any of this interesting and Maybe cryopreservation might play a role in your research program or in your collaborators program. Please get in touch. Uh, we have an open webinar that we talk about all of these things. Uh, we go to the Society of Cryobiology and other meetings, and we're also hiring postdocs. We're actually, we have a process now to take uh, postdoc applications in centrally, and we can then think about where you might best fit in the different labs that are part of the ERC, which is basically nationally. So we have MGH in Minnesota, UC Berkeley, UC Riverside, Texas A&M, as well as uh, Carnegie Mellon. So I'll acknowledge lots of uh, fantastic people to work with collaborators, funding from a number of sources. Um, and I thank you for your attention. John, thank you so much. Uh, really great talk and super interesting talk topic. I love it. The floor is open for questions from our audience. Yes. Uh, John, I'm, I'm so pleased to see thermodynamics shining beautifully here. Um, uh, a, a question um, on this paradigm that uh, all thermal folks who work on heating and cooling struggle, right? Uh, it's a sources phenomena. There's diffusional lens that you have to deal with, with limitation of the time scales, lens scales, thermal non uniformity. So you went around this with a seed with particles. So utilize laser or magnetic uh, uh, RF, whatever heating to, to uh, transition from surface to volumetric. Still, none of particles is a problem, I feel like, right? Generally, uh, we, we, in the ideal world, no nanoparticles is better than nanoparticles, right? So in this regard, did you guys explore uh, natural nonlinear resonances? For example, even though water is weakly absorbent at low intensity or only at certain frequency, and if you go to the higher uh, intensity and uh, higher resonance mode, you can go to nonlinear absorption volumetrically free of particles, utilize all of your effects. So, so the, the question for those online is about, are there uh, strategies for rapid warming that don't use nanoparticles? I see a fascinating topic for our afternoon discussion, Andre. Great, all right. No, but I, I mean, people have actually tried a lot. So, so there are uh, people that have tried microwaves, people have tried dielectric heating, people have tried high intensity focused ultrasound. So a lot of different approaches. Most of them have some fatal flaw. You can kind of guess what some of them might be, thermal runaway, dielectrics are non, uh, you know, it's temperature dependent, you know, et cetera. So 
if somebody can figure out how to do this better, that's great. Um, and you know, that's as it should be, right? We're gonna hopefully make, make progress. But this is the first time that we've been able to make volumetric heating work. So, I totally agree, Mark. Yeah. Um, yeah, Todd. Uh, thank you, John. For the cryoprotectant, you, you sometimes see the glucose is used, or sucrose, or um, even trehalose. What's the the rationale behind choosing the cryoprotectant sugar, and uh, is there an advantage to them? Well, yeah, this is actually a big call out. I, I've been telling my students this for a while, and I, I think it's really a call out to the field. A lot of these cryoprotectants have been discovered serendipitously, including glycerol. It was a mistake. Okay, let's just admit it. <laughs> it was a mistake. They went off to the pub, you know, and were having beers, and glycerol was discovered because it was actually, they were going to use it uh, on the slide to look at the sample later because it was a great way to prepare it for the slide. And then they discovered that it actually survived freezing and thawing. Well, there's that empiricism throughout cryobiology. And these cocktails, many of them are put together in that way. So I think there's room, there's a lot of room, to do more mechanistic development and combination of cryoprotectants going further. That said, there is rationale. So the organic solvents tend to get into the system. They will permeabilize, they'll go through the membrane. The sugars don't, they're too big. And so what people do is they combine them to achieve different things. So if you add like, you know, eight molar cryoprotective agent to a tissue, it usually doesn't like that. But if you do, let's say four to six molar, and then you follow with the sugar, the sugar will suck the water out of the cell, kind of like what the Rana Silvatica is doing with its glucose. And you'll, you'll uh, as, as the temperature continues to drop, you'll get to maybe a vitrifiable concentration within the cell. So it's the, these kinds of, um, I guess, trade-offs that you have to work with. And triolose, it just has a higher glass transition temperature than other sugars. And so for that main reason, people love it. Uh, but people have been using sucrose, glucose, triolose uh, for a very long time. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you for the super talk. Uh, my question um, is related to um, you know biomechanics. So did you look at uh, the changes, your potential changes in cellular and tissue level biomechanical properties before and after vitrification? And does that impact the mechanical properties of tissue or cells? Yeah, we, we haven't looked at all of them. It isn't like a routine assay that we do after all of these, but uh, there's, there's an interesting side story around that, which is a lot of people uh, that do impact biomechanics are interested in this question because they want to be able to, let's say, have a cadaver that they throw in the freezer and then whatever study they do on that cadaver or pieces of the cadaver that has been frozen that they want to report as fresh. So it turns out that there are differences between frozen and fresh, and those have been documented, some, some by our group, some by many other groups. And cryoprotective agents, so, so one of the things that happens in freezing is that you lose water if you're not careful. If you lose water, you tend to align collagen, so your, your you know, modulus curve stiffens, right? And so you will see that. If you use a cryoprotective agent, it tends to keep the water in the tissue, and you'll keep that modulus more closer to fresh. But that's just like a very rough general. I'm just trying to tell you that it matters. Freezing matters. Uh, and I don't think it has been designed into most systems that it that it would be exactly like fresh. Yeah. Kind of following up on that, uh, say maybe for the zebrafish model system, have you looked at transcriptional profiles, proteomic profiles as a function of time after recovery to see how long the sort of freezing effect lasts? No, that's a great point. And actually, I, I gave a talk at uh, University of Pennsylvania. I don't know if any of you know Dennis Disher, but uh, Dennis and I were in graduate school together. And, you know, first question I show these is like, John, what happens after, you know, you just blast that thing? Because there's pressure waves too, right? Uh, so there's, there's like very likely some things going on because of adding the CPA, right? But then there's anything that you're doing that is perturbing the system that can turn a gene on. And we don't know yet. 
So we're, we're asking you know, the first questions, and I think there's a lot of other ones that are coming. Um, there's a lot of questions around, you know, like if you, we, we were chatting about this a little bit earlier, but like, <clears throat> can you take organs right now today in the perfusion, normal thermic perfusion industry, people are talking about taking organs that wouldn't be used for transplant and reconditioning them through normal thermic perfusion. If we can understand if there is any injury from crop preservation, maybe we can also use that, but we need to understand it. So, I mean, you're, you're right and, and we do, but it's, it's, a, it's the next level of question, kind of. One last question, any last takers? So I have a question. I mean, you know, kidney's great for getting nanoparticles in because it's heavily vascularized, liver is heavily vascularized. What do you do with a tissue that or an organ that's not so heavily vascularized? Yeah, so- Thinking about the eye. I mean, there's parts of the eye that are heavily vascularized, but others not. There's an ARPA-H call, Ross. We should talk about it. Literally, I just found out about this, but there is the replacement eye thing. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we should talk about that. But uh, <clears throat> I, I don't have a good answer to that. I think uh, there's some question around lung too. Yeah. How are we going to do this in the lung? Uh, but like you know, the ovary, I had no idea how poorly vascularized the, the ovary is. It's very tortuous. So we've tried this on the ovary, and uh, you know, it it works if you can get enough in. But the perfusion is just not as robust as you would have in a, in like a well vascularized organ like a kidney or a uh, you know a heart or a liver. So it's it's a thing. It's the final frontier. The final frontier. Yeah. John, thank you for a great talk. This is this is a super cool subject. You know, like it was kind of fringe esoteric as you said back in the day, and it's not fringe. This is this is like really important stuff, so. It's happening, man. Yeah, so thank you for, for uh, teaching us about this, and you know, congratulations on your center. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for coming to visit Georgia Tech and Emory. Pleasure. Thank our speaker. Thanks, everyone.